Well, um, recently I've um, been uh, <coughs> asked a, a, a very uh, important question and, uh, in, uh, in the work that I do. And uh, I find that when, when people keep asking uh, uh, the same question wherever you, wherever you go to around Wales, it, it, um, it kind of flags up a very important issue for the church. And in one sense, I, I feel compelled really to, to speak on, on what is this recurring issue of, of the day for for God's church. And, and it's this, it, it's that church life has become very complex, hasn't it? This complexity of, of restarting, of, of getting back to, of doing church. The, the pandemic has taken its hit on, on all areas of society in all parts of the world. It's taken its hit on, on all areas of society in all parts of the world, in, in, you'd probably say in pretty much every industry. And the church is no exception at all and it's complex it's challenging and often people say well when when can we go back to what it was before and the answer is this is we're never going back you can never go back you can't turn back the clock and go back to a period of history it's just not possible not for the church not for anyone else we we live here and now and the question that's been asked is, what is, what is the gospel today? What is the gospel today post-pandemic? And, and in one sense, it's not even what is the gospel today post-pandemic. It is, what is the gospel today in a vaccine world? What is the gospel today in, in a vaccinated world? And it's been a challenge, isn't it, for churches across this country and across the world in, in getting going. And the reason why it's such an important thing to address it, it is this because god's word addresses what it looks like for churches to exist in a challenging world it's always been the same for the church they've existed in challenging times and it's no different two thousand years ago they existed in challenging times there was persecution we might have different challenges today and they had different voices that influenced or tried to influence the church. And Paul, when he wrote his letters, he was, he was addressing the churches and saying, well, listen, I, I know you've been influenced by so-and-so who says this, and I know you've been influenced by so-and-so who says this, but hold on for a minute. Hold on for a minute. Don't be influenced. Don't let someone else come in and spoil this. Listen to God. And so all these letters are written in the light of others trying to influence the gospel. And Paul is saying, no, no, don't let others influence you. Don't let this festival get in the way. Don't let this person who says this get in the way. Because if he says this and that's not the gospel, then that's no real gospel at all. So all these letters in the New Testament are written in terms of challenging times. And it's no different today. We live in challenging times. And there are many voices that have influenced the gospel even today. Think about it for a moment. Let me give you an example. Two years ago, two years ago, how many of us would have said church and then talked about church and then said, well, we have to be careful what the government says. We wouldn't have said that two years ago, would we? How many of you would have said two years ago, well, we're going to do church, but we, we've got to be careful about the cleaning rotor. We wouldn't have said that two years ago. How many people would have said two years ago, well, we'll do church, but we've got to be really careful where we sit. Or we've got to be careful about our masks. It wouldn't have happened two years ago. And yet, all of us as Christians, all of us as churches, all of us as Christians, all of us as churches over the last 18 months have been heavily influenced by all of these different factors all at the same time. And it impacts us, whether we know it or not. And we've got to be careful as Christians to be reminded that we, that we live in a fallen world. And in this fallen world, Jesus Christ has been sent. The gospel is there, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it's not meant for a safe society. Rather, the danger has always been there. The danger has always been there. 
somebody recently said to me, he said, um, he said this, they were talking about church and they were saying, well, we're not sure whether we should do this. We're not sure whether we should do that. And the reason why we're not sure whether we should do this and the reason why we're not sure whether we should do this is, is what about the risk of doing this or the risk of doing that? We're just not sure because we're wondering whether it's too risky. But then this man switched it around and said, what about the risk of not doing it? You see, the danger has always been there. And that is why the Lord Jesus Christ was sent. And the challenge for the church has always been there. That there are always these external influences that we've got to grapple with, that we've got to relate with, that we've got to work with, and we've got to understand and we've got to meander through about how are we as churches going to be the hope of the world to those who need to hear about the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. The first thing I want to encourage us with this and to remind us and to challenge us of is this, is God's salvation points to the most dangerous problem. God's salvation points to the most dangerous problem. Paul, he writes to the church in Rome and there in, in uh, chapter 1 verse 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. God's salvation points to the most dangerous problem and God's salvation is saying, listen, the power of God is this, that there is salvation for, for everyone. And why is there a need for salvation? Romans 1 reminds us, verse 21, for all that they knew God, they did not honour him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Therefore, God gave them over to this and to this and to this and to this. My friends, God made this world. He made this world good, but then Adam and Eve sinned and we all sinned. And God has, has given people over to their desires and, and, and we are darkened in our thinking and futile in our thinking. And the wages of sin is death. Here as we read Romans 1, you see the behaviour that, that people exhibit. It is because they've been given over. And the consequences of this is the wrath of God is being revealed against all the ungodlessness of men and women and boys and girls. See, God's salvation is there because it points to the most dangerous problem that there is sin in, and there is the wrath of God and our hearts have been darkened and we are enslaved and we, we cannot do what is right. We don't know often what is right and we, we're meandering in the darkness thinking, well, shall I do this? Shall I do that? And, and this list is it's, it's not exhaustive. It, it's not telling us everything, but it shows this moral decline. And, and it shows not just the outward, but it, but it shows the heart. Like we were talking about this morning, that the heart is full of deceit. And, and the nicest person that you might know the nicest person on your, on your street or the nicest person that, that you can think of, even you, even me, cannot really see them for what they are. God's salvation points us to the most dangerous problem because when God sees the heart, he sees it all. We're not the best judge of characters, but God sees it all. He sees that we're sinners through and through. He sees that our hearts, are, our minds are darkened and our thinking is futile and, and he gives us over to do the desires of our heart, the, the things that, that are sinful, the things that are wrong. I had to fill out a, um, a form just recently and I was filling in this form and it asked for, uh, you know, when it asked you for a reference. And as, as I was asking for a reference, I was thinking, who do I put down as a reference? And, I, and I'm sure you've all done this when you've been asked for reference. You're all thinking in your mind, who do you put down as a reference that's going to give you a really good one? Isn't it? Yeah? 
You want a really good reference, don't you? You want somebody who's going to see you in, in, in the nicest light possible. You don't really want a reference of somebody who, who doesn't like you or thinks ill of you. We want people to think good of us. Who do you ask? Well, imagine you ask God for a reference. What would God's reference be for you who sees your heart? It's entirely possible that as we have had this last 18 months, we've been affected in our, in our thinking. We, we, even as Christians, we've been affected in our thinking. We ask the question, what is the real and present danger in our world? What is the real and present danger in our world? And maybe we ask the question thinking, well, how do I love people around me in the real and present danger of our society? And I've got to be very, very careful here as I speak. What is the real and present danger? And I, I'm, I'm not for one moment kind of putting down one thing over the other. And I've got to be really careful. But, so let me use a, a, not a contemporary example, but a historic example. Let me use a historic story. There were, there were people who came to Jesus, weren't there? There were people who came to Jesus and they, they came to Jesus and they wanted Jesus to heal them. Because they knew that Jesus had the power and authority to heal them from their sicknesses. And they came in their crowds and you'd have houses full because people knew that Jesus was the person who was able to, to heal them. And remember, there was a story of 10 lepers that came to Jesus and they were all healed. And all those 10 lepers, they, they went and Jesus said, go, go, go and give your, give your thanks in the temple. But you remember the story. Only one came back. Only one realized who Jesus Christ really was, that he was the Son of God. And there was no point going to the temple because the Son of God was right there. He'd already met him. The other nine might have been cured of their leprosy. They might have had healthy and safe and happy lives. But if they had not come to acknowledge who Jesus Christ was, their own saviour for their sin. Then it, being cured of their leprosy, wouldn't have mattered at all. Do you see God's salvation? It points us to the most dangerous problem. And we need to grasp the reality of the wrath of God that sin is our biggest problem, that sin prevents us from being right with God and having a relationship with him, that this life is temporary and this life is going quickly. I know we say the pandemic has, you know, gone on for about 18 months, but you all look a lot older than I last left Cliddock. You really do. We've all, we all look that little bit older, don't we? And we've all said the same things, you know, it's just, it just feels like we've rushed on. It's our biggest problem. We need to grasp it. Time is short. Eternity is real. God's salvation points us to the most dangerous problem that is our sin and that we are futile in our thinking. But, but secondly, sinners need persuading about God's salvation. Sinners need persuading about God's salvation. Romans carries on in chapter 3 and he says, Paul says, there is none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks God. All have turned aside. Together they've become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. There is no one righteous not even one. And sinners need persuading about God's salvation. Evangelism is, is not about sanctification. Evangelism is not about uh, taking people that is described in Romans chapter 1 and giving them a makeover and saying, here's a self-help class to, to make yourself have a better life and to cure yourself of this or that. It's not about sanctification. It's not about being better. It's about salvation. 
It's about being saved. It's about being saved from sin. It's about being cleansed. It's about being forgiven. It's about having your sin removed as far as east is from the west. It is about being made right with God. It's about being justified. And we as Christians are called to try and persuade people that they need God's salvation. Paul, in verse 16, has understood, hasn't he, the power that brings faith in Jesus Christ. He's understood it's God's power, that it's God who converts people, and that we are called to to do whatever we can to try and persuade people. Listen to Paul in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And he's writing in the context of his responsibilities as, as an apostle. And he says this, Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone, to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew, to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means, I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel, that I might share in its blessings. Christians, we're in the business of persuasion. We're in the business of persuasion, of trying to persuade people about God's salvation. Conversion is about what what God does by his spirit. And we can't do anything in and of ourselves. We need God to work in power. We need to pray for God's power to come. And by his spirit that he would work powerfully in us and through us as individuals and as churches. We speak. We live. We witness. The story of Naaman in the Old Testament what happened in the story of Naaman in the Old Testament? Well, he, w- he wanted to be cured of his leprosy. He heard about uh, this man, Elisha, that could, that could help him. And when Elisha told him, you know, go and dip yourself in the Jordan seven times, Naaman was like, no, I'm not going to go and dip myself in this dirty old river. But then what do Elisha's servants come and, uh, uh, Naaman's servants come and do? They said, listen, has Elisha asked you to do anything difficult? It's persuasion, isn't it? God uses persuasion. And he's persuaded, actually, it's not that difficult to go and dip in a river seven times. And he's healed and he's converted. Think about the demon-possessed man that that Jesus meets as he goes over to the other side of the lake when he's calmed the storm and he he meets a demon-possessed man. And this demon-possessed man cannot control himself and no one else can control him and no one else has got any power over him and he doesn't have any power over himself. He cannot change his life whatsoever. No one, not even him, can do anything until he meets Jesus. My friend, if you've got any issues in your life, if you've got any difficulties in your life, you're challenged with anything, you can't do anything. You need Jesus to meet with you. And Jesus says in his word, he says, if you... If you come to him, if you seek him with all your heart, he will not drive you away. Come to him. Search after him. As somebody said, uh, uh, there's a man in the Bible, Zacchaeus, and Zacchaeus was short and he wanted to find, find Jesus. And he was so short because there was a big crowd so he couldn't find Jesus. He couldn't see him. So he, so he climbed up a sycamore fig tree to, to look for Jesus. And he was trying his best. And the point is this, is If you try your very best, if you search with all your heart to look for Jesus, don't worry, he's going to come and find you. And he did on that day. And Jesus went straight up to that tree and he looked straight up at Zacchaeus and said, Zacchaeus, I'm going to come to your house today. And he said, salvation has come to this house. For the Son of Man came to seek and save that which was lost. Persuasion. We can't do it ourselves. We need to meet with Jesus. And if you're not a Christian, you need to meet with Jesus. And you can ask him to come and meet with you. And he will not turn you away. Think of Lydia. Lydia was religious. 
There she was in a place of prayer and she was religious. She was, a, she was known as somebody who, who followed God, but she needed her heart opening, didn't she? She needed God to come as, as Paul was, was preaching and, and, and Paul was speaking the word of God. God was working powerfully by his Spirit and the Lord opened her heart and she responded to the gospel message. There's a challenge, isn't there, in how we reach people and how we try and persuade people. And looking at Romans chapter 1, everyone is different. If anything, Romans chapter 1 teaches us everyone is different. And the things that people do are different. Think of the different things that are listed here. And let me use a a really extreme example. I told you this morning about... uh, having a pack of cigars when I was six. Not sure if I've told you about the time that I was in a prison cell. Did I tell you about that one either? Okay, that's another story. But I was in a prison cell. And I could have stayed in that prison cell. And I could have stayed in that prison cell for years and years and years. But in God's goodness, I didn't stay in that prison cell and I was let out. But if I was in a prison cell, if I had committed one of these things at verses 29 and 30 talk about if I committed one of those things well the gospel of God is really clear that I too am a sinner in need of his salvation that I too need persuading and how you persuade somebody in prison today is going to be very different to how I persuade some of you who are sitting here in front of me who are free to walk out of your houses and enter this public church it's different isn't it It's different, isn't it, in the way we try and persuade people. And we as Christians, we've we've got to be agile. We've got to be agile in the way we communicate this gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because it is the power of God for, for everyone who believes. Think of our communities. It's just obvious, isn't it, even in one community, that everyone is different. There are those who are religious. You go to church or chapel. And there are those who are not religious. There are those who are, who are far off in a, in a distant land with, with absolutely nothing and wanting, to do, wanting absolutely nothing to do with God. And there are those who are actually quite near and looking for hope. And they know that God is someone who they need to pursue. There are those who will come to church And there are those who will never set foot in a church building. There are those who are are incredibly open-minded and who will talk to you. I remember I was on a journey once. I was off to a wedding and I had to share a car. And uh, my friend was driving the car, um, or uh, I was driving the car, and he was in the passenger seat. And he said, um, we had about a three-hour journey. And he said to me, um, he said, listen, I, I heard you've just become a Christian very recently. I said, yes, I had. He said, well, well, I'm not, and uh, you've got three hours. Persuade me. He was very open-minded. And we'll meet people who are open-minded, and we'll be able to talk with them as freely, as openly as we possibly can, and there'll be those who are closed who will never want to talk to us at all. In our communities, everyone is different. And yet they all need persuading, because the wrath of God is being revealed and eternity is certain and there is heaven and there is hell and yet today is a wonderful day of God's patience because he is slow to anger and he's abounding in love and he doesn't want anyone to perish but everyone to come to repentance my friend if you're sitting here today and you haven't yet put your trust in Jesus God is patient with you and God wants to turn your life around And he wants you to put your faith in him. And then he will help you to live the life that he meant for you to live. And you can put your trust in him today. And all these people in our communities, they they need persuading. Maybe maybe it's persuading through through us and in the way we speak to them. Maybe it's persuading through the church and what, what the church does. But we're all placed, as Acts 17 says, that we're all placed in different places and different times. And that God is not far from each one of us. As we live in these complex times trying to redo church and trying to get things going, then we'll, we'll start to ask, well, what works and what doesn't work? 
Maybe there's a tradition that we've held for years and years and years as churches that actually start saying, well, does it work? And the answer might be, well, it doesn't work anymore. Well, my friends, there's no power in tradition. There's only power in the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because only in the gospel is there the power to save. And as churches and as Christians, we look at everyone and we say, from the moment that somebody is born to the moment they die, That is our ministry as ambassadors of Christ to persuade people, to pray for people that they would come and put their trust in a God who sent Jesus Christ to die on a cross for them so that they could be made right with him and have everlasting life now and forever. You see, my friends, it's Christians who have been plucked out of darkness and brought into the light. It's Christians, it's we who are Christians, who've been brought out of darkness and brought into the light. Our, our thinking has been transformed. We've been, we're no longer futile in our thinking, even though we do things that are futile and that are wrong. We've been brought out of that darkness. We've been transformed. We've been justified. We've been saved. We've been, we're a new creation. And, and we're the ones often that need persuading, isn't it? That's why in Romans chapter 1, verse 15, he says, So I am eager to preach the gospel to you who are at Rome. Paul's talking and he's saying, I'm eager to preach the gospel to Christians. Not just non-Christians who don't know Jesus, but to Christians. Because we're the ones that need persuading. We're the ones who need our minds changed. We're the ones who need to think differently. Because we're the ones who've been brought into the light. If the apostle had to write a modern day letter, if you had to write a modern day letter and, and, and write to the church in Clinic or the church in Krakow or, or the church in London or the church in New York and he had to write and encourage us of all the things that we're doing well but also to write of all the things that we need to correct, what would he say? But he doesn't need to because it's already here. We're all placed here to try and win as many as possible and that might require some change but not on the part of outsiders not on the part of them because we need God to save them it's us that need to be sanctified in our thinking it's us that need to be changed because we're the ones who have been brought into the light we're the ones who are being sanctified in our thinking so that we can reach those who are unsaved we're the ones who are here to help people in the darkness because we're the ones in the light And we need to engage with people wherever they're at, wherever they're from. And then we need to pray that God would work powerfully in us and through us. And finally, the wrath of God means there is an urgency. Paul, he he put up with so many different things for the sake of the gospel. He put up with shipwrecks. He put up with famine. He put up with the sword. He put up with beatings. He put up with all these things for the sake of the gospel in order that he might save some. Listen to what he says in in 1 Corinthians 9, just a few verses before, and he says this, he says, if others receive this right from you, we are we not more deserving? He's talking about his rights as an apostle. But he says, we have not made use of this right. Instead, we endure everything so that we may not be a hindrance to the gospel of Christ. You see that? He He's saying we endure everything so that we may not be a hindrance to the gospel of Christ. Let me ask you as I kind of come to close this evening, what is it that God is calling you to endure for the sake of the gospel? What is it that God is calling you to endure for the sake of the gospel so that we might save some and win as many people for the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ? I know some are are struggling to to come back to church. But isn't it worth it to come back to church so that at 10.30 or whatever the time that your neighbours see that that you've left the house? Why do you leave the house? Why do you leave the house every Sunday? Why do you leave the house every Wednesday? Why do you leave the house? Well, I've got a hope that goes beyond this fallen world. And I want to know more of my Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. What else do we have to endure? Well, I need to spend time with people. 
I need to get to know them. I need to engage them. I need to get to know them because they're all so different and, and it will require different ways of getting to know them. And some, it will be opening up our houses for a meal and sharing food with them. Others, it will be an arm round the, the shoulder. And for others, it will be as simple as, listen, I know you're struggling. I really do. I know my neighbor is struggling. I know you're struggling. I know you're down. I know you're worried. But do you know what? What you really need, you, you need to come to church tonight. You need to come and sit down and, and listen to what I hear week in, week out and, and find out about the hope that I have. Is that so difficult to endure just speaking to people? But we must endure everything for the sake of the gospel. Many years ago when I was in university, I, uh, I met... Uh, I met, a, I met a person who uh, uh, had a different faith and I was trying to persuade them. I was trying to persuade them that there is only one God, there is only one Lord, and that he sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to be the saviour of the world. I was trying to persuade them and I was trying to persuade them of the urgency of, of trusting in, in Jesus. And and I was trying to pray for them and uh, I was trying to share the gospel with them. And, uh, and in the end, they, they said to me, I said, listen, <clears throat> um, I don't think you're right at all. I, think, I, think, I don't think you're right at all. I think my faith is right. I think your faith is wrong, Paul. And he said, uh, he said this is what we'll do. He said, this Sunday, I'll come to your church and I'll listen to everything that the pastor of the church says. I'll come to your church. Next Sunday, you come to mine. So that's what we did. I went to, he came to mine one Sunday, and I went to his faith centre the next Sunday. And as absurd as that sounds, to give up even going to church for the sake of the gospel, as absurd as that sounded, this was the conclusion. My friend said, I've listened to what yours has said and you've heard what mine said and my answer is this, I'm sorry but you're wrong. My way is the right way and that's the last I heard from him. Twelve years later I had a message on Facebook Messenger and the message went something like this, Hi Paul, do you remember me? I came to your church twelve years ago and you came to mine. I didn't understand it then, but I've understood it now. And I've just been baptised and I follow Jesus. And do you see? All we're called to do is to try and persuade people and pray for them. And we might have to go to absurd, absurd lengths and to, to take down our own interests even. And yet we're assured that God's word does not return empty. And we never need to be ashamed of the gospel. We never need to back down and say, well, you believe what you want to believe and I'll believe what I want to believe. Because we know the Lord Jesus Christ has come and he has died and he has been raised to life and he has ascended into heaven. And today is a day of salvation. I wonder what is your own personal challenge in reaching people like this? May I pray for you and may we pray for me that we will be more bold with this gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we would endure everything that we might win some we're going to finish by singing great is the darkness that covers the earth but that's not where the the gospel message ends the gospel message ends on hope that in the darkness there is this light and that we are called as christians and as churches to declare the wonder of the lord jesus christ to a broken world we'll stand